stayed in an abusive relationship with his father for fear he would be taken from me. I'm grateful for deliverance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What another person thinks about me is not my business. I have exactly two concerns these days. One, how God sees my influence on my children. Amen. And two, how they feel about themselves. Yeah. yeah. I am also a foster parent, uh, certified for pregnant and parenting teens. We are trying desperately in Sacramento County to stem the tide of foster children breeding foster children. Amen. Um, whole family placement, which is what the program is called, allows foster youth to keep their own children outside of the system. Mm. Those of you who have done it know that parenting a child someone else has raised <laughs> is a lot like running a marathon in someone else's shoes. <laughs> they might look normal. They might even be your size. But chances are, there's going to be some stretching, some parts that rub, some parts that are too loose or too tight. You really can't see what's inside, what sort of stuff might be in any German folks in the house. <laughs> um, and it'll slow you down. You can make progress, but it's going to take some adjusting. And there's no guarantee that they're going to fit at the end. As a foster mother, I've been forced to learn to do my part and release the outcomes. Amen. But isn't this what the biblical principle illustrates? Yeah. Right? Um, I printed from the New Living <coughs> Translation, but I would suggest that, that maybe if you're writing these down, that you compare them in different versions of the Bible, just in case you want to know if what King James has said it <laughs> about these. But any version, um, and I compared more than one to, to see what the entire message was that, that God was giving us. Um, in Matthew 13, verses 3 to, through 9, he told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on a shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. And soon they didn't have, uh, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell on thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. We are not guaranteed success with the residual or the incidental crops as we move to do our assignments. But how much time do we spend chasing birds, cutting our feet on rocks and shallow soil, trying to pick up seeds and miss the miracle of the main crop? Satan loves to keep us distracted trying to cut off thorns. Eventually, emotionally and physically, we're wounded and wondering why there's no reward. Learn to keep your eye on the main harvest. With children, our job is simply to plant the seeds. When and if they take root is up to God. Yeah. Okay? So next would be wife. I like that title. <laughs> People ask me what it's like to be married, and I say, you know what, I've been married about half my life. The question is, what is it like to be happy? <laughs> inside of American culture, and I kept insisting on serving my guests first before my family. She kept passing the plate and reminding me, husband first, husband first. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember that God is not an American. His order, heaven's culture, is not my natural inclination, and I have to be reminded to practice the Beatitudes at home first. Amen. Amen. No matter how much good I do in the world, if I neglect my head, my heart, 
the other half of myself that is the completion of my creation in God's image, I'm not building the kingdom, I'm denying it. If the Bible tells my husband to love me the way Christ loves the church, then I must be a spouse to him in the same way that the church is Christ's bride. Amen. Okay? So, Matthew 25, I didn't quote it all, it's just where it is, but all ten virgins were waiting for the bridegroom, right? They all wanted to be included in the celebration. They all wanted to be a part of that relationship. Only half of them were prepared for the long haul. Yeah. Right. Only half of the marriages in the church survive because they aren't prepared for the long haul. Wow. Okay. What? Rescuer, right? <laughs> if the five who had done their work had fallen into that trap of being rescuers, they would have been bewildered. So, we did what we were supposed to do. We <laughs> to the people. Why are we locked out? Right? <laughs> A true servant takes care of home first. Amen. Amen. Those unprepared virgins were adults with the same access to the same resources as everybody else. Amen. Okay. <laughs> There's a lesson there. Be careful not to place yourself in the position of savior when God has chosen to let someone learn from their own choices. Amen. Amen. I am a doula, which is a birth coach, a community advocate, a teacher for homeless women in a job development program, and a sister friend in The Birthing Project, which is an organization that focuses on lowering the poor birth outcomes in the black community. I love all these roles. But the doula work, by far, requires the most sacrifice. What keeps me in the trenches? Three out of five black babies end in abortion. So when I encounter a woman who chooses to honor the life of the baby in her womb, regardless of how it got there, I show up. Mm. Amen. No matter when, no matter who. But that's also time away from my family. It's unpredictable hours. It's sleep deprivation. And for those who can't pay, it's lost wages. And burnout would be very easy without healthy boundaries. I'm proud to say that I've supported last year lots of couples, married couples who look like me, who chose on purpose to have their babies. But for every one of those couples, there's five young women that don't have those same levels of support. Okay? And the only choice that she's been able to act on is actually giving birth to her baby. And I don't believe, well, there are a zillion, million, billion unplanned babies in the world. Amen. But there never, ever, 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 ever has to be an unplanned birth. Amen. Right? Amen. Okay? But in my experience, people who need the most support have the least amount of skill receiving it. And the fewest tools for maintaining healthy relationships. So basically, manipulation can become a survival skill. And I've seen a lack of gratitude present with the strength of a mental illness. I can't take it personally. Right? Only one leper came back in Luke 17 and said, thank you, right? Amen. That means 90% of people in a crisis get their needs met, and then poof, <laughs> right? <laughs> On to the next. The truth is, not everyone we serve loves themselves enough to love us back. It requires grace. Not because I need to feel valuable, but because I know they are. Even if they don't. Amen. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Mm -hmm. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. As you love yourself. We miss that part. Even though we apply all the other commands from the Bible and the prophets and even some of our personal preferences. We know, for example, that this is just a building. Yeah. But it's been set aside for God's holy purpose. We won't disrespect this house of the Lord. We are temporary shells, good for about 80 years or so of human existence. But our bodies are temples for the spirit of the living God. Yeah. Right. Set apart for a divine purpose. Because of the duality of purpose, that's both physical and spiritual, a duality of care is required in the natural and the spiritual. I'm going to let you dwell on the quality of the items you allow to enter your temple through your eyes, through your ears, through your mouth. But I will say this. There's nobody here that would let somebody get so comfortable, so familiar, that they would prop their feet up on the altar. <laughs> I would also say not to let anyone get so comfortable and so familiar that you allow them to prop their feet up on your altar. Amen. Okay? Amen. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, but I'm going to read verses 1, verses 3 through 4, and verses 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil went away, and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Jesus showed us three things here. One, we don't have to prove our worth because of emotional blackmail. Yeah. It's not tied to the physical demonstration of your ability. Let me say that again. Your worth is not tied to the physical demonstration of your ability. Amen. Okay? Two, self-care is necessary to successfully implement your ministry. Three, if we stay focused on the big picture, for instance, serving the entire community versus proving one person wrong, <laughs> the temptation will pass. Amen. There is a fourth lesson here that could easily be missed. No is a complete sentence. <laughs> if you're not physically and emotionally and spiritually nourished, it's not yet your time to serve. Okay? Um, this last thing, it may not seem like a, a service role, but I am a natural hair artist. <laughs> now, mom is back there getting all the degrees for counseling and, and all of that stuff. Um, but I'm, for black women, with our experiences in general, and certainly our heartbreaks around our clown and glory, I end up being a therapist. <laughs> but a beautiful thing happens when a woman trusts you to touch her head. And for some women, that is more intimate than being naked. She tells you her truth. She is vulnerable and possibly seeking validation. So even though you don't usually get to see the two together, I get to be pro-black and pro-Jesus. <laughs> but it would be very easy for me to forget my place in that power position, right? When I hear the stories of unwed parenthood and abusive relationships and unhealthy choices and substance misuse or abuse and all manner of heartbreak, my mind automatically wants to judge. And not like discerning right from wrong judgment, 
which is what we're commanded to do, but that condemnation judgment. Yeah. That's not the place for me of serving God. That's not my place. That's not my job. Mostly because it can lead to hypocrisy um, or that spiritual amnesia where we forget who we used to be. <laughs> but I can't be a Christian unless I was once a sinner, right? Yeah. You just can't. So as a braider, I am, I am not what they call heavy-handed. Anybody who's tender-headed knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not a heavy-handed braider. I can't be a heavy-handed Christian either. Um, I can recognize um, the difference that I'm, that I'm able to make. What I love about braiding is the before and after, like what she comes in looking like before and what she leaves looking like after. And I know I got it if she puts on the best when I'm finished. <laughs> like, oh, she's feeling cute. She's going to get better herself. So I love that. Um, but my job is to build her up. It's not to tell her what she should do or shouldn't do or solve her problems or offer unsolicited advice. And it's also wrong to invalidate her feelings. If she's sad because of a breakup, it doesn't matter whether or not she should have been in that relationship. I need to minister to the fact that she's sad. Amen. Right? She has heartbreak. If I fill in her gaps with human wisdom, though, if I fill in her gaps, if I take that on, then I'm robbing her of the opportunity to grow. And giving her spiritual advice before God has prepared her heart to receive it is like throwing pearls before swine. It's not helping. I can ask questions like, what's your plan? I can invite her to explore a different reality. Um, I can laugh with her. I can cry with her. I can share my life's lessons. But bringing out her natural beauty takes my hands and it takes my heart. It takes my mouth. Mm. Natural care is celebrating how something is. It's not changing it. It's not deciding it's unacceptable. Um, but as I'm doing that with her hair and as I'm doing that with my mouth, I also have the obligation to respect her story as hers, which means I don't need to tell the next client what the last client <laughs> did, what she said, right? I have a condition that I call approval addiction. Um, I get very, very uncomfortable if I feel like somebody is not receiving me or receiving my intention the way that I wish to, to bring it. Um, and I believe many of us who serve, that have that, that nature, suffer from low self-esteem. Sometimes we recognize it. But other times, we're trying so hard to be perfect that we don't see it. But what I know is God planted the seeds of purpose in each one of us. He planned us before we were knit together in our mother's wombs, right? With full knowledge of the circumstances that we were going to be born into. He rooted our purpose in our gift. So when we receive the Holy Spirit... That living water mm -hmm. is what produces those fruits, the fruits that are greater than just the human process alone could have done. I don't know anybody whose passion for their purpose, the passion for it, isn't born in their experiences. What you love could be the way that you give or reach out to people. I love food. I think it was my favorite thing. Um, so, God gave me the ability to cook. That's a way that you can serve people with something that you're good at and that you enjoy doing. But you know what? That, that, that thing that you can't stand in people sometimes could be not only what God has delivered you from, 
but your biggest opportunity to win souls for the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. You've got a sense of empathy. You know what it takes to come out of certain things. You know how difficult it is. Us non-smokers have no idea how hard it is to walk away from nicotine. Yeah. Yeah. But somebody who broke the habit they yeah. have skills. They have they understand where the setbacks happen. They understand how to walk away from it. So that would be the person I would turn to. If I had an issue, I would go to the person who didn't have it anymore. Yeah. Not the person who had the key. Okay? So I would say learn from your test. Keep in mind that the ones that surface again and again and again and again are probably the ones we bring ourselves. <laughs> so I have a third husband. But, <laughs> but stay focused. Um, listen. Listen for God's voice. Listen from the wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom in this room. And I personally get very, very happy when I see elders. I see them doing well. Amen. I get excited for the rest of these knuckleheads out there because I know, I know that the, the potential for where they're going to end up is here. Amen. Um, so the people who live the furthest in the past are my inspiration for what's going to happen in the future. And I'm just, I'm happy about that. <laughs> um, don't delay or rush your growth process with synthetic growth hormones like ego or impatience or excuses to avoid working on ourselves. God might just be using the fertilizer that you go through to grow you into something more beautiful than you could ever imagine. So going back to Romans 12, I'm picking up a little further in. It says, if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, and I say God's people when I think church, but I also say God's people when I think God so loved the world. Amen. Yes. <laughs> be ready to help them. Yeah. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, inside and outside the church. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Amen. For missionaries, it's a beautiful job description. Yeah. And with that, I would say God bless your servant's heart. Yeah.